Welcome to Pedo Teeth Talk, brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, a show that delivers cutting-edge ideas for the professional specializing in pediatric dentistry and promotes the highest standards of patient care with today's top experts in the field. Now here's your host, Dr. Joel Berg. Thank you for tuning in to Pedo Teeth Talk, where we bring you the contemporary issues important to you and your practice, brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. I'm your host, Joel Berg, and thank you to our Pedo Teeth Talk sponsor, Hugh Freedy, for helping us bring you great content. We couldn't do this without them. Visit them at www.hughfreedy.com. That's H-U-F-R-I-E-D-Y.com. We are here today with Dr. Rhea Hogseth to talk about a whole host of things related to pediatric dental assistance and also the challenges we're facing and having hiring them and keeping them. So we're going to learn a lot today of great advice and information from Dr. Hogseth. Dr. Hogseth has maintained a private practice in Marietta, Georgia from 1982 to 2017. She attended the University of Louisville Dental School and completed her pediatric residency at Rainbow Baby and Children's Hospital, Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. She is a diplomate of the American Board of Pediatric Dentistry and a fellow of the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, the American College of Dentists, the International College of Dentists, the Pierre Fichard Academy, and the Academy of Dentistry International. She is a past president of the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry and also of the Southeastern Society of Pediatric Dentistry and the Georgia Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. Dr. Hogseth has been a national spokesperson for the APD since 1989. She is a fellow and member of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences and an active member in the National DeMort Mass Disaster Team, serving Region 4 as a forensic dentist and odontologist. She is the founder and director of the Atlanta Pediatric Dental Assistant School in Atlanta, Georgia. She is also the founder and director of Pediatric Dental Team Association. She is committed to pediatric dental team members and continues to develop ways to enhance their knowledge and skills both in and out of the office. Rhea, you have so much to offer us. We're grateful for you to be with us today on Pedo Teeth Talk. Thanks, Joe. I'm very happy to be with you. So today, Rhea, in our short time together, I'm going to get you back, by the way, to talk about the forensics and probably about dental assisting again, because there's so much to cover. So let's get started. Uh, dental assistants, you know, let's talk about the marketplace, about training, how to be competitive, how to be the top of your game as a pediatric dentist. Uh, so first of all, just going along with your background, you have a broad wealth of experience in all aspects of pediatric dentistry as you just heard, as we just heard so what what prompted you to to do this to, to create this dental assisting uh, schooling this program well as you heard I did have my own private practice and I sold it in 2017 but before that starting back Uh, when I really realized that this is a big issue was in 2013 and I was just so frustrated by the lack of training of people coming out of the schools around my area whether they were the year-long schools or just a few months and they were generally learning regular dental assisting no pediatric at all Uh, I was an externship site for them for years and I was absolutely amazed by the lack of knowledge of what they had so they can make provisional crowns, uh, you know, with, with in the chair side and things like that that are not even procedures that are performed by pediatric dentists. They were good at those things, but weren't experienced. Is that, is that what you're saying? Well, I'm not sure they could even do that because most of them could hardly su- uh, sit at the chair side and suck spit. So I thought, what are they learning in this school? They paid good money and spent a lot of time, but they weren't coming out with anything. And I have since learned that that is a very common problem for people throughout the country that yes. they might have some training in their area, but they're not coming out knowing anything. So they're basically having to start er- over and a lot of them are saying they'd rather just start with somebody who knows nothing rather than somebody who comes out of these programs who thinks they know a lot. So because it's a little bit different attitude issue there. I see. So that's what caused me to start my own school. I just went, you know, I can do better than this for sure. And that's how I started it. That's uh, fascinating. It's, it's kind of like I used to hear from this rollerbladers that, uh, 
if you roller skated, that's a disadvantage. It's better to teach a rollerblading from scratch, not having any experience with, with the roller skates. <laughs> but uh, we'll come back and talk about that. But I also want to, right at the start here, talk about this, this sort of crisis that's developed, not even sort of, uh, in the shortage of finding dental assistants and pediatric dentistry specifically we're talking about. You know, everywhere I look, I talk to friends all over the country. It seems to be a bigger problem in certain areas, but it's a problem everywhere. Some people have figured out some smart ways to get around it. But tell us about the shortage, how long it's been going on. Do you see any light at the end of the tunnel? Uh, I hope there's light at the end of the tunnel for sure, but I think it's gotten so much worse. Um, I do have uh, the association members throughout the world and it's not just a u.s problem by any means um, and they're located in both urban areas suburban areas rural areas it doesn't matter just about everybody has noticed the lack of of training from the people they have access to or they don't even have any access to any trained dental assistants they don't have any pool of people to to you know draw from right. and now you know, with all these uh, corporations that have, uh, especially since the pandemic, they've raised their entry-level pay to people with zero experience. It's We're finding it hard to p find people with, with no knowledge of dentistry at all that are willing to work and, and to become trained in a dental office. Yeah, and related to that is you, you just mentioned that Sometimes it might be better to hire people who don't have experience and seems like it's going that direction because people are getting paid higher amounts to do other things. And that's sort of the pool of candidates. Um, but also, what about the fact, as I understand it, that the, the requirements by state licensure entities are so varied? And as you alluded to earlier, in some states, you need no training to be an assistant and you can step in and do everything as an assistant. Some require like a full year. How much of the problem is that, the fact there's no sort of national standard? I think, well, nationally, there pretty much is always an entry level that people can come in without any training whatsoever. But, you know, and the base pay of that's pretty low, and that's, that's the ones we're talking about having such an issue with because they can't get people to come in and, and train them. So the, the states that need a longer thing, I, I find that to be, uh, whether it's a 1,000 hours, six months, uh, a year, that's usually before they can get to be certified or registered in that state. They have a, a maybe a state test that they have to take, and they're not allowed to sit for it unless they've been in a practice that long. So there is still an entry-level area to get in there to get them that experience, but that's the people that they're finding difficulty hiring. But, but in general, would you say that that entry level you're talking about, you know, then they can go uh, have some experience first? What, what are some of the core competencies that you offer in your school? And I want to get in for the rest of the program about the training program and tell our members about it. The, how, how, what, are the, what are the main areas in pediatric dentistry that are the most important in training dental assistants as early as possible in that entry into the practice? Yeah, that's interesting and a great question because I ask the uh, doctors who hire my graduates, what's the number one thing they're really looking for? Um, and most of that is, is communication skills and mm -hmm. uh, chair side. So, uh, you know, regular forehanded being able to sit there and actually assist. Here in Georgia, we don't have any uh, entry-level requirements at all. But to... Uh, take x-rays they have to take a state-sponsored radiology course and of course they have to have OSHA HIPAA and uh, CPR and that but nothing as far as any dentistry if they're just going to do that not take x-rays there's no requirements whatsoever so uh, it, it makes it challenging to know what people are actually looking for but that's what I have found communication skills and then share side yeah I, I have a lot of friends uh, pediatric dentists general dentists around the country who tell me that w when there's no requirement otherwise, they often prefer to hire people because they have those communication skills you're you're talking about, and they have sort of the customer service skills. Uh, you know, I worked in situations where you know the dental assistant didn't like to talk; they were kind of an introvert, this and that. That doesn't go well with pediatric dentistry. So, <laughs> so it no. seems like you know, like you and I were talking, and it's like if you work at uh, Nordstrom or the Ritz Carlton, you know, we have like two interviews. 
to see what kind of communicator and customer service perspective you have before they even interview for the job. Is, is it kind of like that for us? Definitely. You know, there's that old adage that was always hire for personality and then train them. You know, we used to even hear in den- dental school, at least I did, that you can train a monkey to do dentistry. Uh, and so I think that's still true. Um, I think some of the attributes that people really look for when they're looking for a new hire, uh, besides personality, should be work ethic, um, empathy, uh, dependability, responsibility, uh, a great positive attitude, um, somebody who's eager, eager to grow and learn or is coachable. You know, they're self-motivated, self-starters. And, of course, the usual honesty <laughs> and integrity. Yeah. You want those, right? Of course. So, uh, and so those you will find, uh, you know, in, in anybody. I mean, it doesn't matter what their career choice has been to this point in I know in my own practice, I definitely looked for anybody who had any customer service experience because I agree with you. I think that's kind of almost number one. Uh, um, do, you have any, do you have any pointers or tips for us? You know, what, what's worked for you and you know, as you've interviewed so many potential dental assistants over the years, what are you looking for? You know, what attributes and that say, yes, that's the person or no, no, thank you. Thanks for alluding to my long years of being in practice there, Joel. Uh, it's, it's worth a lot. <laughs> it's worth a lot. That's why you're with us today to give us that experience. Yeah, thank you. Um, I looked for anybody who had been in any kind of receptionist position because they have had that uh, skill of having to deal with people both on the phone and face-to-face, uh, daycare workers or any kind of uh, elementary teachers teachers in general are awesome to do because they really have those skills of communication and of course the younger ones elementary ed and and preschool are adept at talking to the kids and to their parents which in this day and age is even more important Uh, i find tellers to be awesome Mm. Uh, food service people Yes. Uh, are are great. All those are the ones that I was looking for because I am with that old adage of hiring for the personality and, and the feel that I get from that person. Yes. Uh, as to the rest, I knew I could train them. We will now pause for a word from our sponsor. Do you need additional CE hours but don't have time to travel to courses? Did you attend the annual session and want to listen to the audio recordings? check out AAPD's Education Passport, an online learning center, where you can earn CE and listen to audio recordings from all of our continuing education courses and more. Visit educationpassport.aapd.org. We are back with Dr. Rhea Hogseth talking about pediatric dental assistant training, and you've talked about the shortage of assistants, how to hire, train, hire the person, train for the job. So let's talk about your training program for the remainder of our moments here today. Tell us in general how it works and what the offering is and what feedback you've had and you know, everything about it. Well, great. Well, there's two different things because I have my school, which is a brick and mortar uh, in uh, Atlanta. But I, based off of uh, my school, I developed over 120 different training modules for the students to review and study during the week when they weren't taking uh, the actual classes. Um, And I realized that certainly my colleagues around the country and around the world could use them for training in their own offices and cross-training people. So that's why I developed then the association. So basically it's it's the warehouse of where I store these training modules. So it's a membership site and uh, the modules are about half clinical and half non-clinical. So the clinical are going to be your basic info because remember I used it to train people right off the street. So these are, they're they're set up for people who have zero knowledge of dentistry. So I think that really is helpful in this day and age because we're trying, we're hiring people who don't have much uh, info other than being a patient themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And then there's also a little bit more for experienced ones, uh, as they say, is sharpen their saw. Just get them kind of back into the basics and and, and tighten their skill set. And then there's lots of new skills they can learn. If they've never taken photographs, they can learn how to do that with an actual camera, you know, not their iPhone. Right. Um, 
So and then the 120, is that what you said, modules? Yeah, over 120. Yeah, that's I'm a in lot the, of modules. Yeah, thanks. I've, it took me a, quite, a, quite a while to develop all those. Uh, mm-hmm. And, and I, I, the clinical ones are pretty much all video, so you're actually seeing somebody do something. Um, and I actually started, I start with them on a, a, a model you know, our tooth models like deniforms like we used in school, and then a mannequin, and then finally to a patient. So they get to see it in a slow progression from one to the other. You yeah. know, it's always very hard, hard to video anything in somebody's mouth. And when you're working on a child, it's even more of a challenge. So, uh, do you a lot narrate of these? You do the video. Now, are they narrated by you? Or voiceover, uh, or how does it work? So the clinical ones are actually my dental team that I use to help uh, video these, and it's them talking to the patient or talking to mm-hmm. the um, people watching the video. If it's still on a mannequin or on a, a type of dent, they're talking about what they're doing. But when it's on the patient, you're getting both the behavior control of the patient and or behavior management of the patient and then uh, also uh, describing what they're doing with that patient. Uh, the ones that are more non-clinical, they're going to be more PowerPoints and exercises, workshops kind of uh, in si- situations so that somebody could just literally sit there and uh, look at these and get the basic as though they were at a lecture or if they were at a conference like I have and there's a presenter talking about the different ways to do it. So well, It sounds uh, like with 120 modules, you, you probably cover the entire workflow, if you call it that, for pediatric dentistry from maybe greeting the parents and child in the reception room, bring them back. Are those kinds of things covered too? Yes, absolutely. And a lot of that, again, was because I was teaching the dental assistants to do that because that's what most of us use them for in our offices. They're our main backbone, right, of our communication between us and the patient and the parent is the assistant. The front desk helps when they come in and check them in, but then it's when the assistant goes to get them, it starts there. And that is why it's so important and part of the training that I provide. I'm also working, yeah, yeah. so I've I've recently been talking to people as I I try to get feedback back from my members, and it's, you know, what else do you need, and and they would like some more basic info on front desk admin team Mm -hmm. type things, and so I'm going to develop a little bit more on that, especially, you know, how to answer the phone and and do different things that way, not getting into so much all the coding, because the Academy has a great uh, uh, facility for that great way to get that information to us but more just the other parts of that same uh, setup that we use when they walk in but I do cover the line clinicals or type uh, or communication skills of all kinds even reading uh, uh, body language type things and yeah. and try to read people's uh, emotions uh, marketing infection control risk management how to present yes. a treatment to a parent because the assistants in a lot of offices do that rather than a treatment uh, coordinator, coordinator, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's all great stuff, and I I think um, putting this all together would provide the the entire sort of workflow of of dental assisting in practice. And you mentioned earlier a couple of the entry skills that every office needs. One of those was uh, radiography, for example. You know, I think we all find great differences in the quality of the radiographs depending on the assistant. I, I like to thank the assistant and the child together. You guys did a great job getting these radiographs. Uh, it was a team effort. You did it together. So for that one, I'm sure you've got some nice modular material about that. But does that do you like recommend a certain clinical experience in the office afterwards? Or how do you get that? Sort of like taking advanced life, pediatric uh, basic life support or something. You know, you, know, you, have to do the, you have to do the mannequin afterwards. So how does that work with this, like radiography? Right. Right. Well, we do have a, um, it's done on a mannequin that's really cool that you can take radiographs on it. And actually, they have like a pulp inside of it. So it helps you and be able to see if you get an overlap and all that on the training that I do. Um, it's that's interesting. For you, that's for your brick and mortar school yes, you're talking about. Yes, yes. But, but what, that's about the, what about the seminars online? Yeah, the. Okay, so the ones that you're seeing are actually on existing patients or my staff. So it's it. on. Uh, so we do do some on the mannequin. So uh, we have them without the face on it. So you can really see exactly when you position a bite wing from the side how it's how it's set up in the mouth so those are the really entry the basic level course on the on the radiography and then we move from that to uh, a mannequin with a face on it so they're using the external uh, 
landmarks and then finally show it on a patient doing the same thing. I see. That's great. So do you train by office or by, uh, when you mentioned there are members who get access 24-7 to these training topics, uh, when they become a member, is that for an office or for an individual assistant? So uh, it's for the whole office because I found it's not just for, I start off with just assistants, Joel, but I found that the whole office needs the training that's the non-clinical. But a lot of people are actually using the clinical for their front desk to learn what these procedures are and and to learn a little bit more cross-training so they can talk intelligently about it. And I have different modules on that. So if a parent calls in and asks the front desk about silver diamine fluoride, they have enough knowledge, if they look at my module, to be able to answer their questions and give them information on that. So I'm trying to make it so it's for the whole office so that you can get some of that uh, cross-training and just having the front desk know what the back is going through and what the back gets to learn about what the front has to do, you know, that teamwork helps a whole lot. And, of course, the other thing is both your existing personnel and any new hire comes in have their own way of doing things based on the previous experience of what office they came from. Right. So. A lot of offices use this training just to standardize the, you know, kind of the knowledge base. They know that everybody now at least have this basic knowledge. And uh, and then the doctors can just tweak it to match what they do because we all do things differently and help them develop an SOP because now they've got some basics they can work off of. I was just going to ask you that about SOPs because it sounds like, you know, everything you're talking about here is one of my favorite subjects is process, process improvement, which is what leads to quality management systems so once you get this all standardized not just the training but it really represents the workflow in the office then you also are able to better develop SO standard operating procedures the scripting for interaction with patients risk management systems sounds like you're kind of headed in that direction right so i have that already uh, very much in the the modules that i already have and i have some workshops that people can actually do their teams can do when the doctor's out of the office. Uh, I know that's not necessarily the way it is in corporate, but if you're a a smaller practice, the doctors might go um, off skiing like a lot of people did last week uh, with the Southwest. Uh, It could be uh, the scripting is something the whole team can do and come up with how, what do they want to call the saliva ejector? What are they calling the fluoride? You know, so everybody's using the same words because I found with all my years that the kids in the practice, the, the patients, if everybody in the office called it the same thing, they knew exactly what was going to happen. Right. But if one time they came in and somebody called this, the, it uh, a Slurpee, and the next time it was Mr. Thirsty, they were confused. Yeah. They didn't know what it was. But if it's the same you know, words each time, and everybody in the practice is using the same words, then the kids are much more at ease with it because they know what's happening. So I really yeah. like scripting to help uh, not only dealing with the the, the uh, systems in the office and the more uh, admin side of it, but also working with the, the children themselves. Yeah, that's excellent. Like when I, when I moved to Arizona, I used to call the two-by-two two that you put in the mouth to keep from aspirating the extracted tooth. I called it a trampoline, but down here I learned a better term. They call it the goalie. So yeah, ice <laughs> well, hockey always, prevails in Arizona. Yeah, yes, so, yes. Well, I, like I know. Goalie. Yeah, <laughs> I like that one too. It, well, it looks like the net for sure. And uh, But exactly. I found a lot of people use the trampoline as the rubber dam. So Exactly. Uh, so yeah, so you got to be talking the same language, whatever, whatever yeah. you choose to use. Yeah, and again, with people coming from different offices uh, into you you've got different verbiage so it's just a a quick way to do something and let the staff really be involved in it and then they are uh, really engaged with it and they're going to be more apt to change and use the new than if the doctor comes in and say okay guys we're going to start calling fluoride our tooth vitamins you know if they kind of develop it as a team it, it tends to help that change over yeah. a little bit quicker. It sounds like a future podcast, euphemisms used in pediatric <laughs> dentistry. We'll, we'll get on that one right away. So, Rhea, how do people get in touch with you if they want to learn more about your training programs? So, it's real easy, and you can do everything online. Uh, the name of it is the Pediatric Dental Team Association, so they can plug that in, or the PDTA. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. The website is uh, the, T-H-E, PDTA.org. Great, vpdta.org. 
Well, this was great. We learned a lot, and we're going to follow up with you on many topics. Thanks so much for taking your time and being with us on Pedo Teeth Talk. Thank you, Joy. I enjoyed it as always. And thanks to our audience for listening in. We'll see you here next time. Do you need additional CE hours but don't have time to travel to courses? Did you attend annual session and want to listen to the audio recordings? Check out AAPD's new Education Passport. The redesigned and improved Education Passport is AAPD's online learning center where you can earn CE and listen to audio recordings from all of our continuing education courses and more. Visit educationpassport.aapd.org for more information. For 10% off any product, use discount code TEETHTALK in the Education Passport store. Pedo Teeth Talk is the show that delivers cutting-edge ideas for the professional specializing in pediatric dentistry. Be sure to check out previous episodes of Pedo Teeth Talk, as well as our other podcast platform, Newly Erupted. All previous episodes are available on our website. We welcome your ideas for future shows and guests. For more information on the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, visit aapd.org.